if you're a radiologic technologist or a student in training working on your ART exam or a radiographer, and I hear you mumbling WTFPP in the hallway, I might think that you're actually wondering, what's this filtered back projection? So in filtered back projection, we're talking about how you make images in CT, and it can also be used for SPECT and PET. And filtered back projection, as the name will tell you, really is a simple process of filtering and doing a back projection process. We're gonna go through the details of what is a projection, what's a back projection, and why do we need to filter the data? And then this image on the upper right, just above me, is gonna make a lot more sense after you stick around all the way through the end of the video. Filtered back projection, coming up. So today we're in the driveway here. We're gonna be introducing some basic concepts in CT imaging, namely forward projection and back projection. Uh, first, I wanna introduce myself. I'm Brian from How Radiology Works. This is Bryce from How Radiology Works. And uh, we have a scene here and we're gonna describe the different elements of the scene. So first you can see back here, we have our X-ray source. And then here is our image matrix. We have our three by three image matrix, which is made up of individual image pixels. So this is just a 2D matrix, so they're image pixels. And then inside of some of the image pixels, we have our attenuation values. So some of these have zero attenuation values, and some have attenuation values of one or two uh, attenuation units here. And those are gonna be measured as by soccer cones. And then we have our detector here at the end, and you can see this PVC pipe here. It's separated into three different regions, and that's like our CT detector. So that's gonna be our scene for our projection and our back projection. So now we're gonna talk about the forward projection. So Bryce is gonna simulate the forward projection. So first he's gonna move the X-ray tube, and we're simulating what we call first generation CT, where the X-ray tube would be collimated and we would go one row of this matrix at a time. Go ahead. So in order to do a forward projection, we add up the values all the way along the ray that connects the X-ray tube and our X-ray detector. So we started off with one value there and then two values down here. So as we draw our straight line between our X-ray tube and our X-ray detector, we see that we now have three elements measured in the detector. So now Bryce is gonna to go to the second row here. So in our first generation CT, the X-ray tube would move and then we would take the acquisition. So simulating the acquisition here is Bryce adding up those. So in that case, we had just two units and all of the pixels added up along here. So we'll come back now and then we'll go to the third row here. And we can see in that case, we had two units that were in one of the pixels. And in this case, if we do what we call the forward projection along this row here, we see that, go ahead Bryce, we see that we have uh, two as well. So when we're finally done on our detector, we started off with that image matrix that you saw before. And all we're gonna measure on our detector is three, two, two. So that's all we measure in our detector. And that's why having just this one measurement isn't enough to know what was all in the matrix. So now we're gonna show you another view of the forward projection, namely what we were calling the parallel beam forward projection. Our image matrix is slightly different this time as far as the way we have the attenuation values laid out, but um, essentially the same thing where these are image pixels and then these represent attenuation values. And then let's do the forward projection, Bryce, as we go through. Can you go ahead and do the forward projection of our first row here? Um, so again, this is the detector here. And we see that we had zero, zero, and three. So when we add them all up on the detector, 
it ends up with three in the detector. Let's move that x-ray tube to the second location. Go ahead and do this sum along the second location. Right. Okay, there's actually no attenuation values along that ray, so that was an easy one. So we had zero along that one. And then let's go to the third one, and we'll add these up. And we add those up, and we get three along that direction. So you can see that we had the attenuation values spread out in that direction. We had one, one, and one, and they all added up to three when we did it from that direction, and they all added up to three when they all were three in one location here. So you can see that's why we need different views from different angles in order to be able to separate out where the attenuation values truly are in our image matrix. If we just have one view, we know information about where they're distributed along this direction, but we don't know information about where they're distributed along this direction. So that's really the bread and butter of tomography and why we want to take multiple views. So you saw what happened in terms of the forward projection when we did our actual acquisition along here. We added up the values and on our detector we got three, zero, and three. Now we're gonna show you essentially what the back projection process is. So Bryce, if you wanna start down here, we'll start down here just like we start on a forward projection. And the back projection process is actually just spreading the values along this way evenly. So we end up with one, one, and one as far as the back projection along this row, if we're gonna do the back projection of data from the detector. So then we'll do the back projection of this middle detector. Go ahead. And then we got all three added up. So now it's zero, zero, zero. And then we'll go to the third one. And that detector, if we go ahead, we're gonna have one, one, and one. So again, like we said, we're going to need information from multiple views because if we just had this one view, if we just do a back projection, we can see that the information spread equally that way and it's spread equally in this direction as well. But that's the concept of back projection where you take the value from the detector and you direct it towards where the source, projection, source position was along which it was measured originally. So in this case, we've showed you parallel beam back projection, but the same concept applies with divergent beam back projection, except instead of just straight lines through these cells, through these pixels, you would have divergent beams where the beams would be still connecting the source and the detector. So now that we're done with that introduction on the driveway, we're coming to the slides and we're gonna talk a little more detail about the introduction to projection reconstruction. We're focusing on CT here, but we do note that there's also other modalities that also will benefit from projection reconstruction. But first off, what is reconstruction? So reconstruction is the idea of taking data, those data are in projections, and we're gonna take those data and do what we call construct or reconstruct the object. So if we start with data that's projections through our body, we can think of them like shadow grams through our body. And we talked about that process of kind of adding up those line integrals. So from the source to the detector, we're adding up the values along the line. That's what we measure on our detector. And that's what we're going to take as input to our reconstruction. And we're going to do the reconstruction from there. There's multiple ways to do the reconstruction. There's filtered back projection, there's iterative reconstruction, and now there's deep learning reconstruction. All of these methods can be used to do the reconstruction. We're gonna focus today on filtered back projection. That's been the standard bearer of image reconstruction, especially for computed tomography. So again, just like we said, we're talking about CT, but then also we note that SPECT and PET are two other modalities that also have measurements in the projections. So in that case, we're talking about measurements of the photon decays in SPECT or of the positrons that then generate photons in PET. 
In both those cases, we're talking about surrounding the body with detectors, just like we have the body surrounded in CT, except in CT we only need one side because the x-rays are all coming in one direction from the x-ray tube. So the one modality which isn't in here is MRI and also ultrasound. Those are done a little bit differently. In MR, it's more of a Fourier transform. And then in ultrasound, we're more like back propagating the data along the direction at which it came. This is a little schematic where we talk about projections. What are the projections? So we went through that on the driveway of what is a projection. And we're doing the same thing here, again, showing parallel beam projections. Again, this is through the little bitmoji of my face. And we're doing parallel beam projections. And for each view, you get one projection. And then that's one line on this sinogram. So as we see the sinogram, the we're talking about given lines and those lines or rows in the sinogram, they correspond to one view. And then the detector direction is the direction left right in that sinogram. So we can see that after we take several views that we're going to have basically an object that's tracing out in that sinogram and the objects, like if you're at one point in the image, it's gonna trace out a sinusoidal shape on the sinogram. That's why it's called the sinogram because the objects in the image are tracing out these sinusoidal patterns. Luckily, we know the direction at which they're tracing. So back projection. Again, we talked about back projection in the driveway as well. And we talked about the fact that back projection is basically taking the data and spreading it back out evenly. So the one issue that we have with back projection is that because it's just spreading that data out evenly, what happens is that as we go through and we do back projection for all the view angles, if we do that back projection, we will end up with an image which looks a lot like the image we're expecting, except it looks blurred. So that's the key concept that comes out, that back projection really helps us to transform from that detector plane back to the image domain. But we do need one more step. So if you look at that image on the left, you can see that the image on the left is a blurred version of the image on the right. Again, the image on the left is going through back projection and the image on the right is what we expect to be for the actual image. So we need some sharpening filter. So you could think of doing that back projection process and then doing a sharpening filter in the image space. And that technically would work, especially if you have a large enough detector to make sure you cover the whole object all the time. That technically would work, except it's just more convenient to do that sharpening in the detector space. And again, that sharpening, we're gonna talk about the next slide, how we actually do that sharpening, but you can have a correspondingly mathematically equal sharpening in the detector space or in the image space. And that sharpening filter, it's going to go along the rows in the sinogram. So the sinogram on the left is the original sinogram and then the sinogram on the right is the filtered sinogram. So we can see that the edges are much sharper on that one on the right. And that's gonna really help us out in order to get the accurate image in the end. And what we wanna point out here, the filter goes again along the row direction. So we're filtering along that row direction in the detector domain, not in the view domain. And we're filtering each row in the detector domain. And then that's how we're generating that filtered sinogram. So F in filtered back projection stands for filter again. And finally, we're gonna look at the results of filtered back projection. We take the filtered views, we back project them for all of the view angles. In this case, we've simulated that parallel beam projections. So we have 180 views 
of data. And after we back project 180 views of data, you can see that we can faithfully reconstruct that Bitmoji picture. And we can do so because filtered back projection provides a mathematically accurate method in order to do the reconstruction. So it's a significant improvement upon just that back projection image. Thanks for hanging around. You should also check out our first generation CT video because that has a lot of similarities where we're talking about parallel beam projections.